come at this whole issue from a very different angle. I have no background in finance at all. So uh, instead, I'm a mixture of history, policy, and a little smattering of sociology on top. So you're going to get a slightly different pair of glasses looking at the issue of pension saving. Uh, I have to modify my, one other thing as well. I still got jet lag. Um, when I was up in the uh, earlier meeting, I was put on first thing in the morning and I was quite perky. But I'm afraid it's coming in from the side here, so if I'm not as responsive to questions as I might be, I hope you'll be a bit patient. That's all I can say. Uh, my title is slightly misleading. Well, the original title was slightly misleading. Is it Australian Perspectives? As if I was Australian looking at Europe, and I'm not. Um, instead, I'm just trying to say, introduce you to some of the issues that are arising in Europe on the funded pension issue, and suggesting to you that this also might apply to Australia, if not now, then at some time in the future. Okay, this is the structure of what I want to do. I want to have a, a little brief introduction of why individual funded pensions are becoming increasingly important. That's one minute. Then I will talk a little bit about the gender gaps in retirement savings or and income, which is um, a mixture. First, I'll look at the evidence. Is there a gender gap? And then I'm going to look at the causes. And then I'm going to briefly review three main policy strategies, which is a very broad overview or approaches, if you prefer, that you can find in different European countries in various mixes that deal with the issue of gender imbalances. And the three main strategies I've identified is, you know, first, women should be like men. And at the top and the bottom, I'll a woman should work like a man and earn like a man and save like a man, and then everything in the garden will be lovely. The second is, Poor things, they can't help it, they have these babies. And we ought to compensate a little bit for that, but not too much. And the third is, no, they should rely on their husbands or partners or whatever else. So those are the three main policy areas. And then I get to wind up with a bit of a critique of everything and comment and then duck under the thing and go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, this, I think, is fairly well known. Um, we are all facing the challenge of aging societies. In Europe, it's made worse by a global financial crisis. I mean, you had it, I know, but go to Greece, you didn't have it. Um, so really, we're talking about after the global financial crisis where life gets fairly desperate. Um, the Maastricht rules within the Eurozone on public expenditure are reinforced by market pressures, which um, put the Eurozone under extreme stress. <coughs> on the one hand, returns on pension fund investments are falling. On the other, constraints on public expenditure are tightening and tightening and tightening. And most corporations or other entities or um, professional bodies who run DB schemes are restructuring them wildly. So, you have pressure from all three sides. It's a, sort of something of a, 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 a grip. And at the same time, since the global financial crisis, we've seen big changes in employment and employment structuring away from the standard working contract of full-time employment towards zero-hours contracts, underemployment, part-time work, self-employment, which is casualism in a, not under another label, which makes the sort of strategies of full-time saving look even more implausible. Let's shift our attention, though, to gender pension gaps. Um, people often write over a wage gap into a pension gap. It's not true. Gender pension gaps are bigger. In some cases, much bigger. And we have to be very careful when we talk about gender pension gaps to differentiate between those who are in retirement now, who are the product of, of course, past policy and past working lives, and those who may suffer from a gender pension gap in the future, in which case we're talking about super design or pension design or government regulation that's going to take a step towards altering this. Now this is the European picture. I hope it's reasonably clear. You've got the European countries running along the bottom and the percentage size of the gender pension gap is up the side. Um, 
The prize goes to Luxembourg, but I'm not going to talk much about Luxembourg. Um, big pension gaps, though, in Germany, in Britain, in Netherlands. Uh, the average, weighted average is 39%, which is fairly major. This is today, of course. At the far end, you've got the Central and East European countries. Why are they doing so well? A, they haven't got big pensions to begin with. And B, this is, these are countries where, in the communist era, women work full-time as well as men, and hence the pension gap isn't particularly marked. So I'm just point of clarification. When you say 39, what does that actually mean? 30, the female average pension gap across the EU 27 countries is 39% lower than men. In other words, the average female receives a pension in her own right that is 39% below the average male pension. Okay? I, this is not, and I understand this chart, that the Nordics sort of end up somewhere in the middle because they take ameliorative action. Uh, this is Kevin's own chart, called Kevin and Deborah, yeah, you might recognize it, uh, which shows that Australia has a problem as well. Um, and I, I, Ross Clare isn't here for me to thank him, but he gave me, handed over some ASFA data, which shows uh, by five year averages the mean super holdings of Australians that come under <coughs> ASFA. And as you can see, in the older age groups, it gets fairly severe. Um, now, admittedly, one has to recognize that the superannuation guarantee only kicks in for the 40-44 age group or thereabouts. So hopefully, you know, you could argue that the younger ages will be all right, but, you know, the 45 to 49 group where there's a big gap, they're not going to die instantly, you know. They're still going to be around in about 50 years' time, drawing their rather meager pensions and leaving on the age pension. I'm a, I did mention I was a historian, I'm a great fan of talking about time and these things. This, just in case we were wondering, oh, those averages don't look too bad, they're being pulled up by some very, very big pensions on one end, and these are the mean, medium, sorry, super holdings, which are extremely small, particularly for women, and here the 35 to 39 group outstrips the 40 to 44 age group, which I think is quite interesting. Why? Okay, those are your evidence. Now we move on to talking about the causes. And I put my focus on Europe because that's where I've done the work. I haven't looked at Australia particularly. I'm, I'm sure there are people in the room who know the Australian situation better than I do. Southern EU states, generally speaking, the average is marked because mothers have never earned a pension in their own right. They tend to get married, they leave the labour market, they raise families. Um, and except in the Nordic countries, most women in Europe work part-time once they are they've got children. You have sometimes the woman who will go back into work after one child full-time, but then when she has the second one, she goes back part-time. And getting from part-time into full-time work in a tight labour market is proving to be extraordinarily difficult. So if they want to go back in their 40s and 50s, they usually can't. Um, and the trouble is, well, also, there's also the low-paid sector. There is quite obviously a rise of professional women in Europe as well as Australia, and therefore, if they don't marry and don't have children, their pension profiles will be look like, look like a male pension profile. But one out of three high pensions is female, two out of three very low pensions is female. So you've got this bias towards the low-wage sector, which is services, and generally speaking, when we take that together, we recognize that male employment patterns are dominated pension calculation. It is assumed that you will work 40 years plus in full-time work with full-time savings. And if you did a sort of profile of female earning patterns, they don't look like that. And that's the top and the bottom of it. Married women have lower pension than single women, and the more children you have, the lower your pension tends to be. Now this is a chart of uh, total employment record of retired women by family history. So, I mean, it's fairly, this is just the UK, incidentally. It's not the whole of Europe or anything like. So, um, we have never married with no children, and then married with no children, married, had children, and then you've got the number of children showing clearly that the more children you have, the more likely you're going to be 
working only, well, your, most of your time will be economically inactive, and uh, a full-time number of years is it black. The sort of pale is a mixture of full-time and part-time, and the sort of gray is economic in inactivity. I think it's fairly, I try to make the figures as big as possible. This is slightly the same sort of question, again, UK only, um, by uh, different birth cohorts. Women born before 1920, this is the average number of years in what type of employment? These are already retired. It's all over Barbara shouting. Um, born in the 1920s, born in the 1930s, born in the 1940s and the 1950s. And what's interesting here is that, yes, female labor market activity rates have risen, but in part-time work, not in full-time work. And which birth cohort has worked most years full-time? Those born in the 1920s. Why? Second World War. And that sort of speaks volumes that then female labor was needed and was brought in. Further, that's one sort of main area. We, I, I'm probably telling you water is wet when I talk about this, and you're all aware of this, even if you don't articulate it as such. But you know, what, the other thing that strikes me is that the way in which funded personal pensions are structured doesn't help women at all. The impact of compound interest actually widens the pension gap over time. Now, um, you're all finance people. This must look to you like extremely preliminary calculation. I stick it in there because how I worked it out to begin with, that by the age of 55, the accumulation at a constant rate of a male and his wife is going to actually widen the pension gap over time. And this factor is important when it comes to us understanding that the shift to DC, which is taking place in Europe, is not going to help women at all. Uh, this insight was provoked by Michael Drew and his team, which is part of our uh, superannuation cluster. And uh, here in the middle there is something, a quote from a paper he wrote on something totally different, incidentally. The more that is invested earlier, the better the outcome. And the impossibility, all other things being equal, of making up for career breaks <coughs> in the early years by raising contributions later on, because you sacrifice the accumulation that takes place later on. Uh, this is something that, using Mercer data, Gordon Clark, Paul Gerrans, and I hope to be working on further in the future, so that you know, the future iterations of this will have a bit more, a uh, bit more statistical detail. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, grateful to Bernard Casey for this particular graph. This is something slightly different. This is, <coughs> illustrates what the point I'm driving at. This was drawn from data provided by a very large pension provider in the UK which is a simulation model assuming that holding inflation rates, accumulation rates constant, what happens to pension savings over time? The first column with a full 40-year uh, career, we have a full pension. The second column assumes a career break of six years to raise children, presumably, uh, at, from years 10 to year 15, and during that period, no contributions are made. The third column assumes a longer period, 12 years, working part-time, with contributions made during the part-time period, and that's six months <coughs> out of 12, that's roughly how it works out. And the final column assumes three one-year periods of maternity leave during which the employer continues to pay contributions. And you can see, well, there's a fairly major impact of taking time out to have babies to begin with. And the second feature, which is quite interesting for the career break of six years, is that uh, the pension fails to keep up with, um, in other words, drops below the black line. Why? One hates to say so, but what happens to orphan funds? They go into separate area and they charge more. So I mean, that, we think that's probably the impact of charges. I haven't unpacked it fully, we haven't unpacked it fully, um, but the, one suspects that that's what's going on. There's a lot of stuff in this data <coughs> which uh, I shouldn't be showing you anyway. But. Policy. Right, I've got five minutes. Wait. Right, uh, policy, now my focus is totally on Europe. I'm not talking about Australia at all. Um, 
By and large, over the last 20 years, there's been a big push in Europe to get women in general and mothers in particular back into the labour market. There are all sorts of policies, I won't bore you with them, but so a woman should be more like a man is the answer to this problem. And women should work full time like men. And there are a number of pension strategies that are used to promote this. Uh, maternity leave is credited on the first pillar pension, which is the state pension. Um, there is subsidized parental leave at the pre uh, uh, previous rate of wages, in other words, don't just get a small subsidy, you get a percentage of your previous wage being put aside for you. And there's extensive public funding, very extensive public funding in the Nordic countries for preschool and post-school hours childcare. Um, this is certainly, was experienced remembering that you know, the CE states are women who had that before they left the labor market. Central and East European, sorry, I should spell that out. And certainly it's promoted in the countries, Nordic countries now, and in the European community, as a, uh, by the European Commission as a whole. In Sweden, the new um, personal premium pension, which is the tiny 3.5% that goes into your personal account, also includes state subsidies for women who are having children. It's one of the very rare cases where you see a public sector subsidy to a private pension saving. Partial compensation. Again, we can compensate for broken careers by playing around with the first pillar. We can give guaranteed credits uh, for Paris pay-as-you-go pay pensions. We can reduce the reference um, period for a full pension. That helps women who had time out to 35 years or 30 years could be the average if you take it, the, the, the number of um, insurance years that you've got to complete in order to get a state pension. The second funded pensions, um, there are a number of strategies. States uh, can give better tax breaks to the low paid, extra tax relief, or they can even match contri contributions for women who are, are taking time out from the labor market. And very importantly, um, the charges are being controlled, particularly for those who are abandoning their pension funds for a short time. And the unisex annuities are strongly promoted by European law at the moment. And this type of strategy, is, I've suggested, is uh, found predominantly in the Netherlands, and the UK is moving in that direction. Uh, the third strategy, which is, um, I suppose, found in Germany more than anywhere else, is to strengthen um, women's reliance on the spouse. There are mandatory survivors, pensions, benefits in public and private schemes. Um, UK scrapping these, incidentally, uh, in, pro in the public scheme as well as uh, making them voluntary in the private. Uh, there are payments made to mothers to stay at home while children are small, and there's strong protection of divorcees on separation or divorce or annulment or whatever else. I say it's exemplified by Germany, it's a bit harsh. It's strong in Germany, it always has been, uh, but it's also found in part in European southern states. Okay, quick thoughts, my thoughts, which is a bit more, um, a bit less stats oriented. Uh, is it realistic, really, for us to promote full time working careers for every, every adult of working age? And this is a major question, particularly when it comes to families. Childcare is very expensive, who pays? We know that women who are in low paid work, they can't afford to pay for childcare. This is certainly exemplified in the UK. If you say the state should pay, well that's fine, but the state means raising taxes and that's less than popular, and employers won't pay. So that's a big question. What tends to happen in the European sector, and I'd be surprised if it's not happening here, but I don't know, it's just a guess, is that migrant workers are sucked in to take over the domestic tasks that mother doesn't do anymore because she's gone out to work. They come in as private carers in the south of Europe, in other words, into households, or alternatively, they are employed by caring institutions, certainly in the Nordic countries and then in the UK. 
This has raised problems, of course, about migration. Immigration in Europe is a very hot potato, as I understand it is here, and that makes for political difficulties. Also, this business of having pensions so closely and overwhelmingly associated with uh, personal earnings and over a working lifetime will exacerbate income inequalities between households, very obviously. Professionals marry professionals. And the result is that well into old age, you'll have some very well-off households, and equally, you'll have some very poor ones, particularly where their family structure has broken down. And what can be do, done about this? this is a, it will be an issue in the future. Problems in operating compensation for career breaks, well, yes, it's fine to protect people against poverty, but that's not the same as promoting gender equality. And I hope there'd be no woman in the room who would agree that it was. And problems with restoring the male breadwinner, well, this has only offered derived rights. It's been a subject of criticism for many years within Europe. It raises the incidence of female dependency, which is neither politically nor socially popular. And the problem really is, is not that mothers will not work, but that they cannot work full time unless they're very well off and can pay for domestic help. So why should a woman be more like a man? I was not going to break into song at this point. <laughs> should the classic male working life remain the norm? It is, after all, the majority of, uh, uh, the minority of uh, pensioners are male, the majority are female. And we have designed, or seem to be designing, a retirement income that actually benefits the minority, not the majority. And this type of saving is very much what I would argue is social engineering. It is part and parcel of pushing everyone into working in the formal labor market in return for a wage. And really, this structure of working life sort of dates back to the era of industrialization. And I've done enough history to know the difficulties that early industrialists had persuading rural workers to come to cities and work five or six day working weeks. They didn't like it. They'd come in, they'd earn a bit of money, and they'd go home again. And this way we cling to this tradition of structuring work in the context of the new economy, the service-based economy with its IT possibilities, means that the work-life balance could actually be restructured a little bit. And we have to think about the regendering of unwaged work, which is not a popular concept among many men. What I'm suggesting, in other words, is that couples could be given a little bit of flexibility on how they view the balance between earning wages and actually household management, childcare, and so on and so forth. However, I'm also aware, and this is, this is my, me sort of suggesting that what, as far as I'm aware, Australia could do with thinking a little bit about some of these sorts of strategies, that the, I noticed that um, ACRA uh, 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 assumed that actually, you know, the um, the age pension, like the Marxist state, is going to sort of wither away with time. Um, I don't think that's going to happen personally, but that's another story. I think it needs protecting in the imminent future, at least. I think you ought to seriously consider gender-neutral annuities, which I know goes down well, not very well, but nonetheless, you, they should be considered. Sweden, very since the 1970s, has employed the idea of, okay, we have parental leave, and one-third belongs to the woman, one-third belongs to the man, and one-third the couple can make up their own mind, and the daddy leave, as it's called, is lost if it's not used. So that gives an incentive to for men to take time out from the workplace to take care of children. And then we come to this idea of um, pension fund splitting, or super splitting. Um, this is also not popular. However, on divorce, it's uh, certainly strongly advocated in, in, throughout Europe and probably here as well. The divorce settlement has to take pensions into account. On the birth of a child, until the 16th birthday, the pension fund should be merged, as a thought. This is just me playing around. However, what really bothers me <coughs> is what's happening in the labour market of the future. That actually the changing employment for the younger generation is not going to make this type of strategy sustainable over the long run. Australia's had it brilliantly over the last quarter century. I came to Australia in the 1980s when actually there was a slump. And when this whole arrangement of super was being set up as an um, alternative to a wage raise, 
And that point, the economy was not in good straits. Now, I'm not going to comment on your economic future, but I wouldn't suggest that everything in the garden necessarily is going to stay rosy for the next 50 years. And it may be that the younger generation, will, as of the European younger generation, have to face some fairly un 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 unhappy choices. As I've said, professionals marry, marry, marry professionals, and in general, in the lower reaches, you don't get females able to save the same way men do. Okay, I'm just winding up. This is the last one, I promise. <laughs> uh, there is, I suspect, going to be an inadvertent long-term reliance on the age pension. And there's going to be increased pressure on women to go back to the labor market and save more and more regulation, which will not be popular among uh, the self-managed funds, rising compliance and associated costs, and but I'm interested in pension fund governance, and I think this is a topic for another time. Thank you, Noel. Very rearranging, putting the issue of superintendent of the whole of society Yeah, well, that's, that was the job. <laughs> So I don't envy uh, our discussant, uh, Edie Gilly from uh, AMSP, uh, who's the general manager of governance and leadership. That's right. So, where are you going? Thank you, Noel. I thought that was a great presentation, and I really enjoyed actually meet, reading your paper. Oh, wow, you did. Um, yes. <laughs> um, I don't have a financial services background either. I'm new to superannuation. I've been in the area for four years. And when Richard Webb from AIST suggested that I be a discussant in this forum, I thought, holy moly, am I going to be able to understand a word that's in the academic paper? So thank you for writing in plain English um, on a topic that I'm very, very deeply interested in and I'm sure that people in this room are. Um, there's a couple of things I think from your paper that I was interested in finding out a little bit more about. You mentioned uh, that in Denmark there's a redistribution of old age income from the better off to the poorer households in retirement and I just want, wanted to hear from you how that works in practice. How does that redistribution work? Well, it's basically a tax redistribution. Oh. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward, but it is supposed to be... Um, the thing about the Danish system, it's got three tiers. I mean, I can go on about it for hours, and everyone will throw a seat and go under the table. But there's a basic state pension, there is an occupational pension layer, which is single, and then there are a number of additional voluntary schemes on top of that. And the point about the great strength of the Danish system is that it has one, doesn't have competition at the occupational level. It has one per collector. They are individual pensions, but it's all managed under one enormous organization. And so all the stuff about losing when you move, I mean, I, I didn't mention in passing that the, the propensity for women to lose their pensions when they remarry, move, change, they change provider, they leave the labor market and come back in. Is, is removed because essentially the ATP works like the state and it's very easy therefore for the state to see visibly what pension saving looks like and to take tax steps to correct it. I don't know if that answers it. I mean, it's, yeah, it's a rather yeah, brief no, answer. Uh, you mentioned the parental um, leave incentive scheme where um, there's a third for, for the the mother, a third for the father and then a third for the parties to sort out between themselves. I think you also mentioned in your paper that only 24% of yeah. the men are actually taking up the option of taking that leave. Now, maybe that's something that's particular to that country. Have you thought about whether in a different environment a scheme like that might work? Well, you can lead a horse to water, as they say. You can't actually force the issue. Um, this, the country concerned here was Sweden, and they've had this for a long time. And it has, funnily enough, although the participation is low, it has gone up and continues to go up, but it creeps up. I mean, that's the thing. We're trying to change social behavior to conform with a particular model of saving that we want to promote. And a lot of it is written about individual behavior, but one doesn't sort of look at the general, more social pressures for, to conform. And I think that um, certainly at the beginning, men who took daddy leave were laughed at. Now it's becoming more acceptable for men to take daddy leave, in inverted commas. But it's, it moves at a snail's pace. I'm very interested in this time perspective that allows 
uh, people to change their habits, but very, very slowly. Okay. Um, you've talked about some of the things that have been implemented, um, I guess, as, as policy initiatives. I just wonder if there's anything that you've seen that's been implemented or tried, highlighted across Europe, that hasn't worked, but that might perhaps work somewhere else. <laughs> that's a good one. Um, well, what hasn't worked, an awful lot hasn't worked, uh, the, hmm, what might work somewhere else? I'm so, I mentioned pension splitting. The trouble, the, the weakness with that is, that's fine for those who've got pensions to split. There will be people who haven't got pensions to split. I suppose if I was to start from scratch, this will make me thoroughly unpopular, I would have a state-run pay-as-you-go pension scheme where people voted about how much pension they should get. And on top of that, if people wanted to save privately, that's fine. But we haven't got that anymore. I mean, certainly in Europe, it won't work anymore. The uh, budgets and the international money markets won't allow it. So we're stuck with these. And I think the whole, the, the real trouble is the amount of regulation and re-regulation and constant fiddling to try and make this engine run is removing trust. And that is really, really damaging. I mean, I'm, I'm sounding very negative now. I can't think of anything. In many ways, you know, it would be nice if there was a pension settlement that stuck for more than five minutes. But in the UK, the constant tax changes, regulation changes, and another pension act, and another pension act, means that the average person at age 40, 45, hasn't a clue about how on earth they're going to plan their pension. I mean, in Australia, if, let's pretend the worst scenario just for a minute, let's pretend the labor market and the economy do not flourish, let's pretend China gets problems. Let's pretend unemployment goes up a bit. And let's pretend the public budget gets squeezed. What will I do as treasurer? I think what I'd do is start means testing the value of property against rights for age pension, for example. I mean, the voters' revolt would be horrible to behold, but I dare say any government would have to write that out. And this is, you know, if I was asked to prognosticate, I think that's coming over the horizon. We have a tax inquiry on the horizon, and we suspect that that is definitely one of the things on the agenda. Um, in our parliament this week, actually on Monday, there was a bill introduced by the Greens um, to set aside the application of the Sex Discrimination Act to allow companies on a voluntary basis to pay their female employees more superannuation than their male employees. Um, I think I emailed you about this yeah. uh, yesterday. Um, I'm just wondering if you had any reflections on, on that as a policy initiative. Well, it's a very interesting policy initiative. However, it, I, I notice it's voluntary. And, <laughs> and so those who are going to be, those employers who are large enough and rich enough to um, be, so, but it is a matter of benevolence, in other words, it's not a matter of right. Yeah, and it's that's likely right. it's likely to be something that's employed for you know, um, years. but yeah, or potentially for um, you know highly qualified women yeah. who are already yeah. in that um, yes, exactly. that position where they're keeping up with, with men or more likely to keep up with men, um, and it also doesn't fix the problem in relation to um, you know what what the core problems are in relation to um, uh, the wage gap and mm -hmm. and obviously time out of the workforce. Yeah. Well, I tend to agree with you. I'm sorry, we're not even disagreeing. This is terrible. <laughs> I, know, I know they picked the wrong discussant. Sorry, this is a um, you know favourite topic of mine too. So I'll leave it maybe um, open to the audience now. You are taking my role again. <laughs> <laughs> Questions, comments? Up the back. I guess the two trends that I see, or two interesting issues I see coming up in Europe that have been dealt with in different ways by different countries, and I wondered if you could comment on them. The first topic is that of carer credits, which does not gain a lot of traction here in Australia. So I wonder, with the UK having introduced a carer credit system, what your thoughts were around that? And the other one is the move in a number of the sort of more northern European countries to including young people on their pension fund boards. So I guess 
the Netherlands making the requirement that you must have a young person on a pension fund board, and Sweden making it a requirement of their actual pension system that you must take into account the needs of the young as well as the elderly. You can't discriminate against one versus the other. So I just wonder if you've got any comments about those and whether you think the things that we should be, I suppose, looking at here. Well, I think that this, the, the difficulty of sort of superimposing the care and credit system um, from Britain into Australia is that you know, our state, flat rate state pension, you, it isn't means tested, it, you get it. You know. um, and so... I'm, I'm not quite sure what the function it would serve here. The care and credits in the UK are incredibly complicated and they change every hour on the hour, but when we had a state second pension, there were so many years for children up to 16 and then the state first pension was different again and all the rest of it. Um, and also, while extending the credits in 2016 settlement, our government has also uh, raised the number of years contributions you've got to complete, which is going to make it difficult for some women. Because you're going to have to have 35 completed years of, of national insurance contributions in order to gain a full state pension. So, I mean, you, you, one has, it swings and roundabouts, you know, it's given with one hand but taken clawed back with another. That's raising from 30 to 35 years. On the young people on the pension fund boards, yes, there is a friction between the needs of future, particularly in the Netherlands, which has a defined benefit scheme, between the needs of pensions in payment and the needs of, in other words, the members who are already in retirement and the requirement that the contribution rate go up and up and up. I think the inclusion of young people in order to extend information is probably good. I suspect, though, the whole thing is being driven much more by the um, obligation of that fund board to... I mean, the Netherlands is quite complicated. It has a flat rate pension at the, at the base, but by inter industrial agreement, the pension fund must raise the overall contribution to pre uh, an agreed percentage of income. and so. That is going to fluctuate if the state pension fluctuates. The young person's present on, presence on the board, although interesting, informative, and helpful to young people generally, is you know, a, a slight weight in the balance. It is very difficult to interest young people in pensions generally. And that is really a general problem. And so for the sake of education and information, moving outwards, that's probably a good move. For the sake of pension fund management, I'm not sure how much difference it's going to make. I mean, the pressure of the crisis has been such that in Greece, pensions in payment were cut three times. And that, you know, those are people who are already drawing their pension, suddenly discovering it had gone down. I remember being in a meeting with a Portuguese woman who was chairing it, and um, this was in 29, in 2009, and um, she went out of the room, they said there was a phone call, came back looking white and said, I just learned my salary's been cut in half. You know, the sort of degree of pressure on pension funds and pension savings generally has been absolutely lost. Now those are public schemes, obviously, university, public sector, employment, and all the rest of it. But the fund management side of it, in the Netherlands, the fund managers have been sort of driven before the wind, if you like, with the, the requirements of the regulator for the funds to have a certain level of solvency, and they lost that for two or three years. So the whole sort of balance of how the fund is managed is um, it's been backed against the wall. Maybe in the longer run, you know, what your your reflections will you know, bear fruit. You know, in ten years' time, we'll be saying what a terrific idea. But over the last immediate in the immediate past, I think you know it's been that fairly it's been window dressing generally speaking. Yeah, we have a question from your Warren colleague. I hope it's not Dorothy Dixon. It's all right. I'm only going to do this to uh, provoke the discussion, but I'm going to ask Noah about the use of market mechanisms to promote social policy objectives. Now, we worry about whether annuity rates should be unisex or sex specific um, and we have different views. I'm not known and I necessarily but people have different views about um, whether it is appropriate what is fair between inverted commas what the definition of fairness is but it is also to be noticed that one of the amusing things which happened in Europe at the same time that um, unisex um, uh, annuity rates were introduced. Uh, it was part of a proposal that 
all insurance products be not gen be not gender discriminating. And there are all kinds of differences in the um, driving behaviour and accident behaviour of women relative to men. And some people gained from gender neutrality in one direction and lost it in others. Um, I think it raises very substantial problems and I think it's something which this audience ought to think about. Um, I have used, Nell has used, and some of them used to be shared and some of them we don't. Yes, well, um, skewing market mechanisms to serve social purposes is a very messy business. As often as not, it has side effects that are not foreseen. Certainly what um, Bernard is referring to there is a directive that started in 2007 and passed into legislation in 2009 demanding equal treatment in the, ser in the sale of all services and associate, uh, uh, goods and services. You're not allowed to discriminate on the grounds of race, you're not, therefore you should not be allowed to discriminate on the grounds of gender, that was the argument. And lo and behold, as Bernard hinted, young women's driving insurance shot up. But at the same time, their, um, and the annuity rates became gender neutral at the other end of the scale. Now, this doesn't look as though it's going to last. There are too many powerful insurance companies who don't like it. And there's lots of other ways of getting at the same sort of thing. I mean, there are, generally speaking, what tends to happen is that regulation tends to accumulate. If you want to skew the market in a particular way to serve social purposes, you get more and more regulation, re-regulation, re-regulation. The industry gets extremely fed up. And the only people who make a lot of money out of it are lawyers and the regulators themselves. You lose, as a result, any idea of competition. I mean, why have a market mechanism in the first place? Well, the idea of a market mechanism is it produces uh, competition, and competition will guarantee best product at, ma at minimum price. And people can choose. Well, actually, it drives to, you know, this type of activity drives towards uniformity, obviously, because compliance means you will become more and more, more similar, but it becomes administratively complicated and expensive. This is something I'm going to be working on in the future in the um, consortium that I work in. Because I think it's, uh, and eventually you come full cycle, you know, why, why would the, would, did we have so many public services to begin with that were privatised? You had them actually, because before that you had a lot of private services that were semi-regulated, there were gaps between them. Actually forcing the law, enforcing the law was complicated and the easiest answer was to nationalise them. And now we come back again. Um, so, I mean, I, I, and now we're moving steadily towards the pro-nationalisation phase again, because it's rationally simple, and you have to then do away with all this regulatory nonsense. And we go, a Frenchman once said to me, the trouble with you Brits, he said, is it's liberalism, liberalism, and yet more liberalism. You go round and round and round in circles. And he's got a point, you know, it's, there must be other ways of doing things. Well, other European countries do do things differently, but I'm a bit hesitant to sort of leap in there. But to go down the market route on the assumption that all social, you know, deal with social ills is, um, I think, a mistake. Um, uh, Bernard, what, was it you, Bernard, who said to me, would you rather have a pension underwritten by a contract or a pension underwritten by a government? It's a good question. Other questions or comments? <coughs> if not, we're just about uh, afternoon tea time. So, uh, Noel, uh, very wide ranging. Uh, raises lots of issues about the role of government and the role of yeah. industry and the role of individuals in the, in the context of trying to uh, achieve social desire.